Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Cardiovascular Autonomic Testing Revisited. This is Haley Carleton from Inside Scientific, and I am very pleased to be your host for today's event. During today's webinar, sponsored by Finipress Medical Systems, Dr. Archer Fedorowski will explain the physiology of syncope and orthostatic intolerance. He will discuss the background behind the current guidelines and advise on the practical skills required to perform a successful cardiovascular and autonomic workup from his extensive experience. We are now going to be joined by Eric Altena, Managing Director of Finipress Medical Systems, who would like to say a few words. Thank you, Haley. Thank you and Inside Scientific for hosting this webinar. And thanks to all the attendees for joining the webinar. It is an honor for Finna Press that we can contribute to this webinar via sponsorship. At Finna Press, we want to contribute to a better healthcare by developing and providing continuous non-invasive blood pressure measurement systems. With our 30 years of experience, we take pride in assisting healthcare professionals and researchers with their daily operations. Research and diagnostics of autonomic functioning is an important area for Finopress. We encourage all the work that is being done in the autonomic testing labs by many specialists all over the world. And we like to support sharing further knowledge about this. Speaker of today, Dr. Fedorowski is a well-known and very experienced key opinion leader, and I, and I would like to give the word to him now to start the webinar about cardiovascular autonomic testing revisited. Dr. Fedorowski, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for your very kind introduction. And uh, this is my great honor. and. Uh, a real pleasure to be with all of you and to discuss cardiovascular autonomic testing, which is a very important part of uh, assessment of such conditions like syncope and cardiovascular dysautonomia. Before we start, I would like to ask you a few questions, which uh, may seem very trivial to some of you, but which may give us uh, a sort of understanding uh, how you, a part of audience, how you understand the field that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. The first question is, what are the most common causes of transient loss of consciousness? Answer one, hypoglycemia, orthostatic hypotension, epileptic seizures. Answer two, epileptic seizures, head trauma, or cardiac arrhythmia? Answer number three, vasovagal reflex, cardiac arrhythmia, orthostatic hypotension. Answer number, number four, psychogenic pseudosyncope, hypoglycemia, or vasovagal reflex. Please select the right answer. This question is important as uh, in my own experience, Many of clinicians and even common people believe that when you lose your consciousness, it must be due to conditions that actually are not directly uh, related to transient loss of consciousness, such as stroke or metabolic problems and mentioned in one of the answers here. So I hope that everyone has have the opportunity to uh, select the answer. The right answer is number three, the most common causes of transient loss of consciousness are vasovagal reflex, cardiac arrhythmia and orthostatic hypotension. All of these three causes are part of syncope etiology. We're going to discuss it a little bit later. Now let's move to the question number two. What can be diagnosed using head up tilt testing? Answer number one, cardiac arrhythmia, orthostatic hypotension, epileptic seizures. Answer number two, epileptic seizures, vasovagal syncope, cardiac arrhythmia. Answer number three, POTS, 
arterial hypertension, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. And answer number four, orthostatic hypotension, POTS, vasovagal syncope. Please vote now. Again, this question refers to the one of the most basic diagnostic methods for cardiovascular dysautonomia. This method may even detect other problems, other pathologies, but is especially designed to detect uh, pathologies or pathologic responses for circulatory system. And uh, I hope uh, you are well aware which cardiovascular disorders can be detected by head up till testing. So I will give you a few more seconds. Yes, for you who selected answer number four, this is the correct answer. Orthostatic hypotension, POTS and vasovagal syncope are three conditions that may be easily detected using head up till testing. Thank you for taking uh, part in this uh, poll. Now, you may ask yourself whether loss of consciousness is, is this a problem? Is there really a problem? One to two percent of all emergency department visits are actually due to syncope. So we are talking about huge numbers of people attending emergency departments. Uh, all over the world. However, you may be even more impressed by the number 30 to 40 percent of all people who will faint at least once in their lifetime. So syncope is a clinical problem affects a lot of people and creates a lot of uh, anxiety among patients who in some situation cannot obtain cannot obtain the right diagnosis. So that's why we selected this uh, subject for today's presentation. We shall talk about the pathophysiology of syncope and cardiovascular dysautonomia, the background behind the current guidelines on syncope management and the practical skills required to perform a successful cardiovascular autonomic workup illustrated by real-world real examples. We start with uh, cardiovascular dysautonomy and syncope and the pathophysiology. So, what is cardiovascular dysautonomia? Actually, if you look at this diagram, you will see two major components of the circulatory system. The pump, the heart and the pipelines, the vessels. Cardiovascular dysautonomia may affect both the heart and the vessels. And you may see the list of different conditions that are dependent on the disorders in the, in the control of circulatory system. One of these conditions, arterial hypertension, is affecting millions of people worldwide. However, in the field of syncope, we will focus upon orthostatic hypertension, vasodepressive vasovagal syncope and cardio, uh, carotid sinus syndrome and cardioinhibitory vasovagal syncope and cardioinhibitory carotid sinus syndrome on your right hand side. The blue color means that the system is inhibited, whereas the red color means that the system is hyperactivated. When we talk about syncope, it is very important to understand what syncope is. And according to current guidelines, the definition of syncope is a transient loss of consciousness. Duration, maybe 30, 40, up to 60 seconds, sometimes more than one minute, due to transient global cerebral hypoperfusion, meaning when the blood pressure must go down, the brain cannot get the sufficient supply of oxygen for a short period of time, characterized, characterized by rapid onset, short duration and spontaneous complete 
recovery. Now let's move to the next uh, slide, next diagram, which demonstrates a major mechanism of syncopy. The first one is uh, vasovagal syncopy. This is the reflex syncopy, uh, mediated through vasomotor center, medulla oblongata, different triggers like orthostatic uh, challenge, like uh, emotional uh, triggers, uh, pain may evoke response leading to abrupt bradycardia and uh, vasodilation leading to temporary loss of consciousness. The next mechanism in the list, uh, very similar to reflex syncopies, baroreceptor dysfunction, carotid sinus syndrome, leading to the same sequence of uh, events induced by improper signals from carotid sinus baroreceptors, otherwise preserving uh, uh, the right perfusion in the brain. Next, uh, a huge group of uh, cardiac disorders. In the first, uh, cardiac arrhythmias in the first place, then the structural changes that may uh, compromise the uh, cardiac output may, may also lead to temporary loss of consciousness. And finally, the uh, autonomic failure leading to improper response from peripheral vessels leading to gradual or sudden onset blood pressure fall and in consequence to uh, temporary loss of consciousness as well. These are the four main mechanisms of syncope. If we put them in a, a diagram in this nice classification borrowed from current European syncope guidelines, you may see that syncope is the most common cause of transient loss of consciousness. Then a uh, patient may lose uh, consciousness due to epileptic seizures as well. But please take a look at this diagram. On your Left hand side, you see the main uh, etiologies of syncope, and you can see that 35 to 40 percent of population will experience syncope during their life. Whereas epileptic seizures may affect between 0.6-0.9 percent of the whole population. So epilepsy is 50 to 100 times less common than syncope due to circulatory collapse. You will note psychogenic pseudosyncope more frequent in younger patients and head trauma, which is not as frequent as uh, syncope. Um, to understand the uh, syncope presentation in different ages, it is important to understand a sort of age gradient in syncope etiologies. Orthostatic hypotension and cardiac causes are very uncommon among younger people uh, under 40 years of age, whereas the same causes become more and more prevalent with advancing age. And in the age group over 75 years, almost half of all the patients will experience either orthostatic hypotension or cardiac problems as a cause of syncope. Whereas reflex syncope is rather stable, affecting between 50 and 60 percent of all syncope patients. Interestingly, these two major etiologies, reflex syncope and orthostatic hypotension, may be very efficiently detected using cardiovascular autonomic testing. This is emphasized by current European syncope guidelines. That's why we are now moving into the area of cardiovascular autonomic testing as a part of integrated syncope evaluation. This is a very important diagram from current guidelines. And here you can see two paths of investigation in uncertain diagnosis of syncope or in so-called unexplained syncope. These two pathways 
uh, we can call them cardiac pathway and autonomic pathway. Cardiac pathway may detect 10 to 15% of all etiologies, whereas autonomic pathway uh, can cover between 70 to 75% of all syncope causes. In this diagram, in the central part, you will see on your left hand side echocardiography, ECG monitoring, external or implantable devices, electrophysiological studies, stress tests, and coronary angiography. Uh, of this, ECG monitoring is the most important part of the investigation. Whereas on the, your right hand side, you will see cardiovascular autonomic test as the major part of autonomic evaluation, plus ECG monitoring in uh, inconclusive assessment. So please keep in mind this diagram because this is a part of uh, uh, background on which we have built the uh, concept of cardiovascular autonomic testing in syncope. Now to perform the uh, cardiovascular autonomic testing uh, you need uh, staff, experienced staff, you need uh, training and you need equipment. We used to promote concentrating all these assets into syncope units, virtual or physical. The essential equipment of syncope unit uh, consists of uh, usual ECG monitors, or ECG devices, and non-invasive bit-to-bit blood pressure monitor, plus tilt table, which both compose the major part of cardiovascular autonomic assessment. Then you may need Holter monitors, uh, external and implantable loop recorders, 24-hour blood pressure monitoring, and knowledge about basic autonomic function tests, uh, which can be uh, performed in the cardiovascular autonomic lab, which we uh, are going to discuss in a while. So, uh, to compose a syncope unit, you need access to cardiovascular autonomic lab, which is well equipped, and implantable loop recorder services. This is a picture from our lab in Malmö. Uh, our unit has been in operation for over 10 years and covers the southern part of Sweden. Uh, this lab needs uh, priority access to additional tests such as echocardiography, 24-hour laboratory blood pressure monitoring, halter ECG, exercise ECG, and other less common tests. And the workup should be based on current is the European Society of Cardiology recommendations. Now, talking about basic cardiovascular autonomic function test, uh, we should understand which components are the crucial ones to perform the effective testing. Active standing, Valsalva maneuver, carotid sinus massage, tilt testing, are most important and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and ECG monitoring are important as well. Then the major part of cardiovascular autonomic function test could be performed in cardiovascular autonomic test laboratory and we will talk about it more using different real life uh, cases in a while. So now let's walk into the cardiovascular autonomic testing lab. I will show you a few practical examples of different tests performed in our uh, lab. These are real world examples, real patients that were evaluated in our laboratory. You may remember the active standing test as a part of uh, cardiovascular autonomic workup. This is a woman, 20 year old, with Allerdanger syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome with unexplained syncope. And you see the result of active standing test, the abrupt blood pressure fall on standing, leading to dizziness, presyncope, and it gets resolved while the patient is sitting again. You see even the impressive heart rate increase typical for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Now uh, let's uh, move to 
The next example, Balsalva test. This uh, related young man, 37-year-old uh, with unexplained syncope, was actually diagnosed with orthostatic hypotension. During the autonomic workup, we performed this Valsalva test. You may see this steep blood pressure fall in the first part of Valsalva test when you are trying to breathe out with your mouth closed, with a mouthpiece, you measure the counter pressure of 40 millimeter mercury. And during 15 seconds, there is an increased pressure in your airways, which leads to response to cardiovascular autonomic response. In this case, this response is pathologic, blood pressure goes down. And then when the mouth are open, you see that the blood pressure, instead of going up, the, uh, according to the dotted line, the blood pressure doesn't rise as much. And this is a pathologic impaired response, meaning that the uh, autonomic nervous system in this patient is damaged. So it might be a sign of neurogenic uh, orthostatic hypotension, which was diagnosed in this case. Next, uh, let's move to deep breathing test. These two, uh, apparently, indefinishable two young women uh, with uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome show different pattern of deep breathing test results. On the left-hand side, you see the normal fluctuation of both blood pressure and heart rate. On your right-hand side, you see absence of this fluctuation. The uh, response on the, your right-hand side is pathologic and means that the autonomic control of circulation is uh, severely impaired. This patient is more affected than the patient on your left-hand side. And the uh, cardiovascular drugs, uh, adrenergic, anti-adrenergic drugs might be very useful in this case. Now, uh, I would like to tell you uh, a little bit more about carotid sinus reflex, carotid sinus syndrome, which seems to be less known. How does it work, actually? You, you have two baroreceptor centers on both sides of your neck in the carotid uh, artery sinuses. And when you press the carotid sinus on one side, it may provoke carotid sinus reflex, which is pathologic. It means that the other side does not compensate for the uh, externally imposed increased blood pressure using your fingers in this case. So uh, you can see that this is almost the same reflex as in vasovagal type of response. The, uh, the pressure on carotid sinus uh, evokes uh, bradycardia and uh, vasodilation and hypotension and syncope. Now, uh, you would like to see a real life uh, patient, I guess. And this young woman, 50 year old, with unexplained syncope, actually in her bed while sleeping when she was turning her head, was investigated now a lab. And you can see that uh, carotid sinus massage on her right side evokes blood pressure fall, syncope and asystole, cardiac arrest actually, of almost 8 seconds, and this patient, 10 seconds actually, and this patient was effectively treated with pacemaker. So this is a typical patient who would respond to pacemaker therapy. We mentioned reflex syncope in a mechanism of carotid sinus uh, dysfunction. Now we are moving to classical vasovagal syncope, which you may remember is responsible for about 50% of all syncopal episodes in, uh, in all ages. Uh, this is a typical example of head up tilt test, orthostatic challenge, nothing's happening. Then we potentiate the effect of the test by using nitroglycerin, evoking a little bit of tachycardia, a little bit of hypotension. And this woman 
is very susceptible to this provocation, develops vasovagal reflux uh, with uh, a reproduction of the uh, uh, historical symptoms which patients can memorize and you can see both blood pressure fall, deep hypertension and bradycardia accompanying the uh, hypertension, meaning that this is a typical vasovagal reflex with reproduction of spontaneous attacks. The diagnosis is established here. Uh, in some cases, uh, vasovagal syncope may lead to cardio inhibition. You might certainly remember the, one of the first diagrams with cardio inhibitory vasovagal reflex. This is a type of cardio inhibitory vasovagal syncope. And in this uh, middle aged man, 53 year old with recurrent unexplained syncope, uh, this, in this, this case, we were able to establish the diagnosis using head up tilt testing, nitroglycine provocation. And in this case, you may see that although the patient demonstrate blood pressure fall and dyspnea, he faints first after the cardio inhibition starts and produces sinus arrest. You may try to guess how long the sinus arrest was in this case. Actually, it was 63 seconds, one of the longest sinus arrests we have ever, ever experienced in our lab. And this patient was effectively treated with pacemaker. Moving from vasovagal syncope to orthostatic hypotension, you should uh, remember that orthostatic hypotension is a chronic condition, whereas vasovagal syncope is more paroxysmal condition with some underlying uh, susceptibility. This uh, a little bit older man, 82 year old, uh, presented with classical orthostatic hypotension. You see the profound blood pressure fall at the very beginning of head up tilt test. And in the end, he cannot stand anymore and he's uh, tilted down because of syncopal episode. What I want you to see here is this line, which uh, illustrates cerebral saturation, cerebral oxygenation. You may see that the cerebral oxygenation is slowly, gradually going down. And at one point when he is about to lose his consciousness, it reaches the level under 60%, which is the critical level for cerebral saturation, uh, uh, which uh, predispose, predisposes to fainting. Although classical orthostatic hypotension is well known, there is another uh, condition, delayed orthostatic hypotension, which is actually even more common with advancing age. This man, 65 year old with unexplained syncope, was diagnosed with this condition. You may see that the blood pressure is slowly, gradually going down over the period of more than 10 minutes until test, and that he is not fainting at this uh, moment, but he's about to faint when we perform carotid sinus massage. So this is a combined autonomic disorder, afferent by carotid sinus uh, syndrome and afferent by orthostatic hypotension. So we tested his, um, um, his uh, resistance to orthostatic challenge by adding nitroglycerin and you can see here that nitroglycerin induced uh, profound hypotension without uh, real signs of uh, vasovagal reflex. So this is more orthostatic hypotension and carotid sinus syndrome without signs of vasovagal syncope. A very complicated case, actually. And now we uh, move to the younger segment of patients. This young woman, 50 year old, with a profound orthostatic intolerance presented with post orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Here you can see uh, a very abrupt heart rate increase of more than 40 beats per minute associated with dizziness, intolerance, discomfort. And at one point uh, when cerebral saturation goes down and uh, 
gets closer to 60% limit, this young lady cannot uh, stand anymore and the test is terminated due to pressing copy. This is a, a very symptomatic postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome case. Moving uh, for a while out of the lab, out of the cardiovascular autonomic lab, we are now entering other monitoring devices. Uh, the regular 24 hour whole ECG may actually demonstrate some forms of cardiovascular dysautonomia, which may provoke syncope. In this case, you see postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome with very steep increase of heart rate in different uh, times during the 24 hour period. And on the lower panel, you see inappropriate sinus tachycardia with uh, much higher average uh, uh, mean heart rate during the whole day. In the upper panel, you see that patients with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome demonstrate the characteristic dip during heart rate dip during nighttime, which is typical for POTS, not typical for inappropriate sinus tachycardia. You can differentiate the two conditions using this uh, quite uh, simple method of Holter monitoring. You can use 24-hour uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for detecting cardiovascular dysautonomia. This uh, 65-year-old woman with uh, uh, syncope, with unexplained syncope, was diagnosed with orthostatic hypotension. We could demonstrate profound hypotension uh, during the day, in the morning hours, after lunch, and in opposite, you can see the uh, supine hypertension, meaning that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, during the night, the uh, blood pressure increases enormously over the level of 160 millimeter mercury during night time. So this is the typical reverse dipper, and this patient should be treated during uh, daytime against hypotension and during nighttime against hypertension. Okay, now uh, cardiovascular autonomic testing is a part of syncope management as well. This is not only for diagnosis. And in this very nice study by uh, Bob Sheldon and his group, uh, they performed a sort of uh, meta-analysis of different intervention studies in syncope, showing that patients who underwent cardiovascular auto autonomic testing, uh, they received a diagnosis of vasovagal syncope during the testing. Actually, even if they were not treated with uh, drugs, with cardiovascular drugs, they were treated with placebo only. In this group, the frequency of syncopal events has diminished by 50%, which is quite impressive. Um, we have arrived at the uh, one of the most important slides here. This uh, diagram shows the decision pathway for reflex syncope, syncope and pacing. Actually, this is a very nice diagram and pathway that we used to follow in any kind of patients, not only for pacing. In unexplained syncope, when the syncope is severe, recurrent, unpredictable, especially in a little bit older age, we start performing cardiovascular autonomic testing. Cardiovascular autonomic testing is based on carotid sinus massage and tilt testing with different uh, elements, which may be aided by active standing, of course, and uh, Valsalva and so on. Once uh, we find a cardio inhibitory response, these patients should be paced. However, if the answer is not available, if the test is inconclusive, if you have doubt, when in doubt, no doubt, one might say, then you should proceed with implantable loop recorder, which may give you an answer in cases where the events are not so frequent. By implanting a loop recorder, you may detect cardiac arrhythmia, which is uh, potentially treatable, normal, 
in, uh, recording or artifacts may be suggestive of uh, psychogenic pseudosyncopy or um, epileptic seizures. To show you how it works, these are four typical patterns of uh, usual findings from implantable loop recorders, which by themselves are diagnostic in 10 to 25 percent of cases. Now, uh, this is very important here. These four diagrams present actually four patients which were indifferentiable by the history, by the initial workup. But when implanted with implantable loop recorders, the first one demonstrated sinus arrest, probably in the mechanism of basal vagal syncope. The other one demonstrated paroxysmal AV block, which uh, could be treated with pacemaker. The third one demonstrated actually supraventricular tachycardia, tachyarrhythmia instead, and was treated with uh, uh, ablation, with electrophysiological study. And the fourth one, in the fourth one, we detected epileptic seizure. You may see the tonic and then clonic activity typical for epileptic seizures. So for this specific patients, the implantable loop recorder was diagnostic. Before we stop, uh, I would like to promote this GPS algorithm. Uh, otherwise, you use GPS, GPS to get home safely. And you can arrive at the diagnosis safely using the same algorithm for syncope. G is uh, guess in this context. You have to guess what happened by asking your patients, asking about syncope scenario, orthostatic symptoms, prodromes, triggers, other aspects like spasm. You can look at the ECG, at the telemetry findings. You can put for spine blood pressure plus active standing. And you can use some imaging te uh, techniques like uh, echocardiography or angiography. If it doesn't work, in 50, 60% of cases, it doesn't work actually. You may try to provoke the symptoms by using cardiovascular autonomic testing and reflex syncope and autonomic failure, orthostatic hypotension, which represents 60, 70% of all causes may be detected using these specific tests that we discussed just a few minutes ago. And then if it doesn't work, you make use the C method, meaning uh, S, what happens, see what happens. ECG monitoring, long-term monitoring with uh, implantable uh, devices, or in some cases, video EEG monitoring at the neurology uh, department, especially equipped with uh, these devices, or bystander video recording. You can use your actually your mobile phone to record what's happening to the patient when the attack occurs. And this is very useful method, method recommended by current European syncope guidelines. So uh, some take home messages for you. Cardiovascular testing is crucial for diagnosis of unexplained syncope as it may potentially identify up to 70% of syncope etiologies. This testing is important for the diagnosis of cardiovascular dysautonomia as the underlying cause of unexplained symptoms of syncope, orthostatic hypotension, such conditions like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, chronotropic incompetence, especially in older patients and other dysautonomic conditions. And finally, Cardiovascular autonomic testing should be performed by trained staff with access to autonomic laboratory, meaning well-equipped with uh, tilt table and with bit-to-bit uh, -bit, uh, hemodynamic monitor and prolonged cardiovascular monitoring methods such as implantable loop recorders. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Arthur. So, uh, Thank you for your and if you have any questions for either Arthur or Eric, please submit them through the Q&A widget now. Fantastic. And we've received a number of great questions already. So let's just jump right in to our session. So Arthur, our first question is for you. Can we say that the variability of systolic blood pressure characterizes autonomic regulation of contractile function of the heart? Um, yes, to some extent. Uh, 
we have to uh, remember that uh, uh, systolic blood pressure is maintained by heart uh, uh, contractile power and by cardiac feeling. So uh, the heart is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And, uh, uh, its contractility is uh, controlled by sympathetic uh, part, sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, by uh, adrenergic part. But there is another important component in heart contractility. So this is cardiac feeling. So the heart cannot pump uh, blood that is not there. So there must be properly functioning venous return to fill the heart ventricles so that heart can pump the blood out of its ventricles. So we can say that variability of systolic blood pressure characterizes the autonomic regulation of contractile function of the heart and the control of uh, the vascular tone as well. That's great, thank you. Um, Arthur, bearing in mind COVID-19 for infection control, how can patients safely perform the Valsalva maneuver? Oh, this is this is a very good question. Actually, uh, current, especially currently very important. So in our lab, we uh, do not recommend uh, patients come if they feel any signs of infection, of course. They are not, they are not allowed to come. For investigation to our lab. Then uh, for Valsalva maneuver, we use a uh, single use mouthpiece. So uh, our measures are uh, those who are usually uh, uh, applied in the, in the, the whole uh, healthcare system. There is nothing special than just the um, uh, common sense measures. Uh, I don't know what Eric would say about it. Um, would you like to comment yes. on it? Yes, yes, of course. We have, um, I, actually, I agree. It's a very good question. Uh, we receive uh, these questions a lot um, lately because um, in our guided autonomic testing uh, application, uh, Fazalva is one of the maneuvers. Um, what we just, um, what we do, we deliver a um, disposable mouthpiece. So, uh, you know, just one single use, and then um, uh, you connect a new mouthpiece, and um, um, so there. In that way, we um, uh, we reduce the risk of um, COVID uh, nineteen uh, infection. Yeah, and of course, um, I completely agree. When you feel sick, uh, stay at home. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> Arthur, do you spin a press systems alone? Or do you measure brachial blood pressure in addition? Uh, actually, in the lab, in the cardiovascular autonomic lab, we don't uh, we don't use anything else because the Finapress unit has a built-in brachial measurement system, system, which is used for calibration of device just before you start your measurement. So we, uh, I mean, we we feel pretty confident with this system. We don't need another system at our lab. We have the brachial uh, device as well, just in case. We don't use it actually at all. But brachial measurement systems are uh, instead uh, recommended for uh, continu not continuous, but interval measurements uh, of ambulatory character, 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Then you use the brachial system instead. But for uh, the cardiovascular autonomic uh, uh, lab, the FINAPRESS system is uh, completely sufficient. That's good to know. Um, Eric, did you want to touch on um, on anything here? Yeah, um, I, I think Arthur uh, already answered the question very sufficient. But what uh, what is uh, important to understand uh, about the FINAPRESS NOVA? Um, uh, we offer at the Finapress Nova uh, a brachial calibration. Um, so then you see on the screen, on the monitor, you see actually the beat to beat uh, brachial brute pressure um, uh, real time. So um, 
So there is a brachial calibration option in the NOVA. Great. Um, Archer, does the active stand test provide different information than the head up tilt test? Oh, yes, of course. Of course, the active standing test is the physiological process, this is the physiological one, and you are uh, usually using your muscle pump to keep you standing upright and to compensate for the blood pressure for, for the volume shift downwards in your body when, when you're standing. So this is more physiological, but uh, it, it cannot be standardized. Um, some people cannot stand for such a long time as uh, if they were standing on a uh, uh, head up tilt table. Then, uh, on the other hand, if you want to catch the initial so-called rapid orthostatic hypotension, as we demonstrated in one of our, in our, in our slides, then you have to use active standing. The changes are so uh, fast that you need bit-to-bit -bit blood pressure monitor and active standing to catch it when it happens. And the duration of the process is about 15, uh, 20, 30 seconds. So if you don't use active standing and bit-to-bit uh, -bit blood pressure monitoring, you cannot catch the initial autostatic hypotension. Uh, and again, head-up tilt testing is ideal for long-term uh, autostatic challenge. Some people cannot stand for 20, 30 minutes, but you can easily do it while lying or standing on head-up tilt test. Then on the head-up tilt test, you can make people faint. You cannot make them faint while standing because they usually they, they fall down or they try to protect themselves where they feel about to faint. Okay. So I'm, and I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm, uh, I, I hope that I answered the question. Sure. Um, I, on this note, actually, my, the next question was, um, how dangerous is tilt testing? And is there a patient group in which um, head up tilt test should not be used? Uh, this is not very dangerous. Uh, we have had a few cases of uh, tilt test in, uh, invoked uh, atrial fibrillation. This patient had it before, so it was just an, another procedure triggering atrial fibrillation, which was known. Uh, we have never had any serious accident in our lab. However, if you are pregnant, uh, then probably we should not advise it in the, in the first case. Then uh, if you are too young, uh, in the age younger than 10, 8 years, we would not advise to do it. This is not very diagnostic. Uh, then, to some degree, we want the patient to collaborate. The patient that cannot collaborate because of dementia and other uh, these affecting the central nervous system, I would not advise it here either. But we may perform the test despite these uh, circumstances because the information you can get through the test is so valuable that the uh, exclusion criteria are uh, very few, actually. This is, this is not at all dangerous. And this is good even if you faint, even if you demonstrate the cardiac arrest. I just showed you a diagram of a man who presented with cardiac arrest of 63 seconds. Of course, we, might, we may have uh, implanted uh, a loop recorder and wait until he would faint for the next, next time. Maybe he would uh, suffer skull trauma or be even more traumatized. In this case, we performed the test at our lab. He fainted. It was very dramatic and the staff was shocked and the patient was shocked. I was not shocked. I've seen it before. So we decided on uh, pacemaker and everybody was happy. Okay, good. Um, and again, actually kind of carrying on, is there a place for a pacemaker in treatment with recurrent hypotension and bradycardia after initial investigation? Oh, this is, this is a really good question and uh, a source of a great debate among uh, syncopy experts. Actually, uh, the recent findings from different studies such as Spain, Biosync and Issue 3 demonstrated that even if you develop hypotension during vasovagal reflex, 
If the bradycardia is the real cause of loss of consciousness, then by pacing, you may avoid loss of consciousness. You may feel dizzy, you may not feel well, you may feel affected for a while, but in the end, you will not faint, you will not lose control of your body, you will not uh, damage yourself. So yes, there is a place for pacemaker. And in our experience, according to different studies, 15 to 20% of patients who are paced against bradycardia during bicepital syncope, even if they are paced, 15-20% of patients may still experience another fainting episode. And this is due to profound hypotension that we cannot deal with yet. Hmm. Okay. It's interesting. Um, Eric, how can I be informed about new applications and software modules from Finipret? Oh yeah, um, yeah, th that's a good question. Um, um, yeah, you can of course uh, uh, look out, uh, look at our website um, uh, where we inform, uh, where we inform everybody um, about um, uh, the applications and the software modules. Um, we also communicate very often via our LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, um, Twitter accounts. Um, normally, when we are able to travel. Um, then we go to uh, international conferences. Um, um, and of course, um, you can also uh, contact, uh, can contact us directly or um, contact our distributors um, by email or telephone. Uh, we are happy to help you with all your questions. Perfect. Thank you. Um... Arthur, back to you. When do you take action if you provoke um, asystole? <laughs> I, I knew someone would ask this question. This is very tricky. Uh, actually, this is uh, this is just a reflex, and reflex. You know, you start it starts at one point and it comes back to the uh, baseline after a while. This is exactly the same with reflex syncope with asystole. It starts at one point and there is this uh, period of asystole and it, it, you may see the jacking movements. It looks very dramatic and you, it looks like the, the, per, the person in question is just about to die. And then uh, it just breathes in a few times and then wakes up. Uh, so um, it is because the asystole may have different duration and I showed you an example of a very prolonged duration of asystole of 63 seconds. We had another case a few weeks ago, 83 seconds actually, this is very long. And of course, such a long uh, asystole may produce profound uh, hyperperfusion in the brain. Usually we decide on uh, cardiac massage when the uh, um, asystole exceeds 30 or 45 seconds, then we uh, try to start uh, cardiac uh, resuscitation or uh, uh, heart and lung resuscitation, of course. So, uh, but in, in some cases, you, you you want to wait a little bit and see. And usually, you see the uh, uh, QRS complexes on your screen after a while, and then you feel uh, safe. Okay. So I know, and I, I know, I know it sounds dramatic, but this is this is the real life, and uh, uh, they always come back. All people with reflex syncope, they always come back. It may be very dramatic, uh, and usually we will not allow them to uh, stay unconscious and without circulation for more than one minute. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to make this question our last one. Um, what would you consider the essential equipment needed to build an autonomic laboratory? And are there other non-tilt tests that might be important to conduct it as well? Hmm. So uh, in the first place, good training, good knowledge, and your brain open minus. So you have to combine all these elements into one good workup, and we try to make it into a sort of algorithm, a sort of basic autonomic testing in the current guidelines that I uh, would recommend. Then, 
in our place, we use uh, a motorized uh, tilt table, which we can uh, uh, lift and then uh, make it fall down quicker if it's needed. Then we use a good bit-to-bit uh, -bit non-invasive hemodynamic monitor. Uh, there, there are only a few manufacturers in the, in the market now, and you should buy a good one, reliable one, with the possibility of uh, offline analysis after the test. So you need a good software to reanalyze the course of events as what's happening during the test may go really, really fast. So you cannot analyze it on, on uh, I mean, uh, live. And then uh, in our case, we added cerebral saturation monitor as an important part of uh, diagnostic workup. But tilt table and good uh, non-invasive bit-to-bit monitor are the, the basic parts. And then, of course, different elements like Valsalva, like deep breathing. It depends on instruction given to the patient. So you should get good training as well. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for um, this wonderful Q&A session. Um, and thank you so much for all of your insights today, Dr. Federalski, through your presentation and again, through this Q&A session. And of course, a very big thank you to Finnepress Medical Systems for making this event possible.